Hey, this is Carl Franklin. And this is Richard Campbell. And before we start the show, we'd like to bring your attention to some cool conferences happening around the world. Specifically, NDC Sydney, happening August 14th through the 18th in Sydney, Australia. Now, I personally can't make it to Sydney this year, but you're going, right, Richard? Absolutely, I'm going, you know, because Sydney. Uh, Yeah, awesome. I wish I could go. So go to NDCSydney.com and register now. And for more great NDC conferences, go to ndcconferences.com. Right. Welcome back to .NET Rocks. This is Carl Franklin. And this is Richard Campbell. And we're in a fishbowl at Bill. Yes, we are. And it's uh, it's the evening party on the first night, so yeah. lots of people around. So you hear some clinking plastic glasses. <laughs> plastic glasses. That's that clink? A, that's funny that, right there. That's special. Plastic glasses. Plastic glasses. How about glass plastics? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, you're going to hear some party stuff in the background, but we're having a really good time here, and uh, we won't talk about that right now. Let's roll the music for Better Know a Framework. Awesome. <laughs> Man, what do you got? This is an article from popsugar.com mm-hmm. in the tech section. And this is asthma pod. So asthma like the breathing disorder? Yeah, A-S-T-H-M-A pod. Why this pod craze has gone too far. Hmm. So it's short. I'll just read it. We already knew the I craze had passed the point of no return, but it looks like pod mania may be gaining speed in the race. Yesterday I learned about the A pod or asthma pod which is a colorful plastic case that clips around your standard asthma inhaler. They cost about $20, or 10 pounds, because it's a British company. Right. And they come in seven colors. So why am I so bent out of shape? For the most part, the devices are cute, brightly hued plastic that will hopefully make asthmatic children everywhere feel better about their illness. However, the name alone makes me worry and wonder about the day the pod epidemic will end. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> from the laser pod, pod hotels, to energy pods for midday napping, there really is no logic to the overusage of the word pod, which sprang to popularity with the lionization of the iPod. Right. Will three out of five plastic items that are shaped like a bean or iPod be labeled I something or pod from here until eternity? Will we wake up one morning and find out pods are suddenly as uncool as Walkman's? Most importantly, when will it end? (laughs) (laughs) And of course, that's apropos because this is a podcast. Yes, it is. And that term was coined by Adam Curry. And back in the days when there wasn't any such thing as a subscription model for audio. Right. And Dave Weiner, who was one of the original authors on the SOAP specification Mm -hmm. that Microsoft.net used, also came up with the idea of, in an RSS feed, which was for blogs, an enclosure tag, which could point to a binary file. And thus began the revolution of podcasts. But there is no more iPod out there. Nobody no, has an iPod the anymore. The iPod's gone. So the whole, where did the word pod come from is a mystery to most people. Yeah, it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be lost in time eventually, unless we keep it alive. Shall we? I don't think so. I, I think we should care. let it go. I'm I really, with them. I couldn't care less. If I, I'm, I was pretty happy we were just the internet audio talk show for .NET developers. <laughs> That's right. Can we just stay there? Can we we stay can stay there. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Good any, find, man. That's well, a good little that's piece. That's what I got. Yeah. Awesome. Who's, who's talking to us, buddy? Uh, I grabbed a comment off of show 1437. That's the one we did just a few weeks ago with Brian Noyes. We were talking about comparing SPA frameworks. Mm-hmm. And I know we're going to go down a path today talking about different development stacks and stuff. Yep. I really appreciated Brian's take on that, too. You know, he's yep. a very measured guy. He is. And, you know, it does making it money off of Angular, still loves Aurelia. Like right. I, I just thought that was a really interesting take on this. And Aaron really contributes to the conversation where he says, interesting comments around the size of community and how common wisdom leads us to take the framework with the largest community. Yeah. So somehow a bigger community makes something better? I think this is flawed logic, not only in part because there's no measure of how large the second community is. Mm. It's smaller than therefore inferior, which yeah. is clearly not true. But because it doesn't take into account what the community is there for. Mm-hmm. Making no judgments here, I've used neither Angular 2 nor Aurelia, 
But if the community is large because there's a lack of support by way of little or poor documentation, mm. difficult or steep learning curve, is that really a good sign of a product? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. As I said, yeah, that would yeah. explain SharePoint. <laughs> it would explain a lot of bad <laughs> technology. Of course, no, there's a big hey, community I, around it because there's money in it. I didn't mean to say SharePoint was a bad technology. There you go. Right? Please. But it needs a lot of care and feeding. It does need right? a lot of care and feeding. And that, and that means people, for yeah. better or worse. D WCF, perfect example. Yeah. You know? Ingo was like the only guy, and those guys over there were the only people that understood Ever it. Ever really under understood yeah. it, yeah. And they made a, a, you know, a lot of money helping too people do it. Yeah. Aaron goes on to say, developers are a bad bunch for resume development. <laughs> and if the bloggers and water cooler talk is framework A, then it's, hey, let's use framework A. It's what we need. Right. And on my resume, it'll help me move up and out of here. Yeah. <laughs> now Stack Overflow posts and forums and blogs start talking about Framework A and, hey, we've got a large community, so it makes it a good choice, yeah. right? Right. I understand Angular and Aurelia are what Brian's familiar with, but was surprised that a comparison and discussion occurred around Knockout JS. Sure. But nowhere was Vue, one of the most popular open source projects on GitHub mentioned, even in passing. Yeah, we, that's, we're guilty of that. We are guilty sure. of that. And in fact, there's a couple of comments on this show about why are you not talking about Vue? Yeah. And uh, you're right, we should be. Let's it deserves do a show its own it. show. Absolutely. So we'll, we'll get there, Aaron. Thank you so much for your comment and, and your appreciation that you know size is not automatically good. Right. Which begs the question, why do you like Vue? Is it because there's a lot of people using it? Is that what you're saying? You're not saying <laughs> that, are you? You wouldn't say that. I didn't think so. <laughs> okay. So Aaron, there's a .NET Rocks mug on its way to you. And if you'd like a .NET Rocks mug, write a comment on the website at .NET Rocks com or via any of our social media because we publish every show to Facebook and Google Plus and if you comment there and we read it on the show we'll send you a mug. And definitely follow us on Twitter. I'm at Carl Franklin he's at Rich Campbell send us a tweet pod <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. Pod tweet <laughs> I almost did it like this. Send us a tweet pod but I thought <laughs> tweet pod tweet, tweet pod, pod was tweet more pod. funny. There you go Pod and tweet to us. Yes. That's right and uh, that voice you just heard was Holger Mueller. So let me tell you about him. He's VP and Principal Analyst for Constellation Research, covering next generation apps and human capital management. Holger provides strategy and counsel to key uh, clients. Come on, come on. It's good, it's good. <laughs> That's good? It's, it's just broad people. Oh. They can see it on Twitter. All right, okay. On the website, right? So well, enough yeah. of an intro. Okay, <laughs> fair enough. Glad to have you here, Holger. Well, great to be here. I mean, we're rock stars really here. Uh, oh, come on. No, our, our pleasure, man. Builds so much fun. I mean, the energy level's great. Were you in the keynote? Did you get a good look at it? It was, was great to be in the keynote. It's great to be in Seattle for the first time, at least for me. It's my oh, fourth wow. or fifth build. Always nice. was Moscone in San Francisco. The nice weather is special. Yep. Right? So, third yep. day of sunshine. Yeah. It's yeah, very I, unusual yeah, in this know, part of the world. very strange. I didn't bring my shorts because it's Seattle. Yeah, why well, would I, I should I, have. I would need those, right? Yeah. I think I we'll be in a water crisis in a few days here. So. <laughs> You're probably right. It's all getting <laughs> held up somewhere. Yeah, no more water in the conference center here. Sorry, guys. Yeah. Right. Well, <laughs> the pressure's going to Don't worry. Up. I'm from this part of the world. It's going to rain. Just hang on. <laughs> Just wait a minute. Just wait. Weather doesn't change fast. We might be in this transition between daily rain every day and heat thunderstorm coming in June, July, right? This might be the <laughs> transition period of five days before it heats up enough for that. In Vancouver, we say things like it only ran twice this week, once for three days and once for four. Oh, are, <laughs> are you from Vancouver? Vancouver, yes. Oh, yeah, my yeah. God. So. Yeah. Worst, worst place to live. Uh, Spent four months in visa exile in Vancouver. Uh, visa exile. <laughs> From November till February. It uh, literally was visa uh, exile. Uh, and, uh, and it was gray the to, whole if time. If you had to recast 1984 anytime, <laughs> just, I mean, if the smartphone would have been invented and the podcast or the, <laughs> whatever, great. the Facebook stream, you just walk in the street. And 99, 2000. Yeah. And hey, there I was this eczema, there was mold scandal in the buildings, oh, the high-rise right, yes. buildings oh. because of high humidity. They didn't think about this. Well, and people had eczema on their, on their yeah. faces, so yeah, it yeah. was like 984, nothing to cost. It was this combination cost. of the usual water problems, and they changed the tax rules, so the size of your roof footprint made the taxes higher, and so everybody shortened up the roof overhangs, so the water ran down the walls, soaked into the walls, mold everywhere. Oh, they call it the leaky condo scandal, and it's billions. Wow. Like we just, it took ages. They're hey, still fixing them. Your basement was involved in that, wasn't it? Well, my, that was a leaky fish tank scandal, <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> and then again, and your then basement the was involved. Problems, but so we got proper roof overhangs. It's yeah. not that problem. You're but. paying for it. Yeah, now. I've had some water issues over the years. But so the cool thing on Vancouver is nighttime skiing. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Vancouver is the only place where it's 9 p.m. 
the ski lifts are open and yep. the people are saying, shoot, it's good conditions, we'll have lots of after dinner skiers. I see oh. you an avid skier, Carl, right? So I you am. ski you all the time. So, so you normally at nine o'clock it stops, right? <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing going on, it gets cold, it's dying down, they shut everything down. Right. No, in Vancouver they keep the lifts open till yep. eleven because people see, Oh, after dinner, nice weather, let's go skiing for two, three hours till wow. midnight. Yeah. Because yeah. that's the only time it's not raining and snowing. <laughs> no, no, no. And, and strangely it does never s in my four months there, it was always good skiing conditions. Always good skiing, yeah. Wow. Well, we keep we rain in the city, snow on the mountaintops, because yeah. the mountains are nice and high. But they put lights in, so you can yeah. ski at night. But it well, hurts I mean, your brain. I've seen ski slopes open at night before yeah. in Vermont. Yeah, yeah. and in, But in they all shut them down. See something at midnight oatmeal in Vancouver. Okay. And it hurts your brain because you're looking at a multi-million city, you know, you see airplanes coming in, right. container ships, right, all yeah. the lights. And you think, I can't be on skis, right? So right. this, this doesn't, <laughs> the mind can't process this. So speaking yeah. of things the mind can't process, there are some numerical significance to this show I think we ought to call uh, out. Yes, episode 1451. Now, what is significant about 1451? Well, we had to go to 1451 because the birth year of Cristoforo Colombo, nato uh. a Genoa. <laughs> All right. In quel anno. And why is that significant for, for you in particular? Well, you, you had a 14XX number, right? So yeah. <laughs> that right. was interesting. And I this grew up in Italy, one. so I speak Italian longer than English, so pardon my German accent on that. Oh, that's okay. So <laughs> 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 we would do this in Italian, we would have been so much more like, sarebbe una, un podcast melodioso, tutto il tempo e Carlo e Riccardo non direbbero niente. This <laughs> is the so classiest <laughs> episode of .NET Rocks I've ever recorded <laughs> in the last 14 years. <laughs> Where's Cortana to translate this for you? Yes. <laughs> As we seen the keynote today. That was such a good demo. Holy oh, yes. man. Yeah. Man. She sp and fast, rapid Look, fire Spanish. We've got to tell everybody what yeah, we're talking so this, about. The, this was a demo on the, on the keynote. Native Spanish speaker, rapid fire Spanish. Just yeah. the kind that you're like, slow yep. down, slow down, slow down. Yep. And Cortana's translating in real time in English and in Mandarin simultaneously. Wow. Yeah. But the Mandarin didn't work so well, so I'm well, worried about... When he tried to say it back. I'm worried about him being disenfranchised, working in <laughs> Seattle here, and not keeping his Mandarin up. So. Yeah. so is Cortana speaking these languages or just... Doing you know, text no. translation text of translation. So it was, it was speech to no, text no. and translated. So text translation is easy. Because you typed it rightly. This is understanding us. Which yeah, is no, like I understand. I understand. Really hard. But what if what if you had somebody speaking Spanish, it was translated text, take that text to speech in another language, have that one translated, and then have them talk to each other. Is it, is, isn't that a game you play at uh, kids' birthdays? You know, whisper to the next year and see what you hear at the we'll end. play operator yeah. with Cortana's. Well, yeah. one of the things I found fascinating when you watch that run was that it wasn't just, because of course Spanish and English are not word for word, and I couldn't of read course. Mandarin. Yeah. And so you saw it go back and change phrasing as yeah. more words were spoken to grammatically correct yep. the English from the Spanish grammatical structure. Just fascinating. Yeah. It was, it was, bro it was, it was seeing the future, right? It's like, yeah. hey, oh. universal translator. Right. Actually, you're not seeing the future, right? You're seeing inside of our brain because yeah. all the magic source of this is neural networks. Right. And you think what our brain does that I can kind of utter a correct English grammar sentence here, yes. thinking in German, yeah. doing this real time. Yeah, right. <laughs> Whatever, right? So our we brain, the neural English networks do that. We yeah. C-sharp, so yeah. we don't get this, but you, you're a three-language guy, so yeah. that's a going in your head all the it's time. It's ha hard to be European, you know? Yeah, <laughs> it is. You have yeah. to learn at least three There's languages. There's a little C, a little C-sharp, a little Pascal, right? <laughs> <laughs> Ooh la la, c'est le français, right? Yeah, so <laughs> of course, what else? <laughs> and we came with Microsoft show, like, let's do some basic, right? Right, so, let's yeah. do a little basic, yeah. So COBOL, COBOL is really the German, is back. the German programming <laughs> language, right? Which is inherited in the German largest software company's language, which is... Yeah. ABAP. Okay. What? Allgemeine Berichts- und Auswertungsprogrammierung. Ah, yeah. okay. So that's SAP's programming language, which is a COBOL derivative, right? Interesting. And an interesting story, right? Because the still chairman of SAP, Hasso Plattner, wanted the client-server version. This is like late 80s to yeah. be in C for portability. Huh. Ah, because right. it came Back when we thought C was going to be portable. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, so well, many things which didn't is. happen, right? So yes. he wanted it in C. And some developers just didn't listen and took this typical problem programming, right? The end users want different reports, right? right. So yeah. already in the mainframe, they had this ABAP language, which was a general page and report description language, right? So end users or not so smart developers could build the, the screen for doing selections of fields and do the lists afterward, right? right? Yeah. That was worse for 
So they didn't listen to their then CEO, CTO, and just said, we'll program this R3 thing, this client server thing, and ABAP too. And huh. here we go, right? ABAP is the programming language for everything in old style, still running SAP till today. Wow. Wow, indeed. Yeah. And it is the words themselves, are they German words? or is it? Are they well, the original was Allgemeine General Berichts, Report and Auswertungs and Analysis Programming, right? Right. Now SAP has kind of like an English acronym for it, but I'm not sure. Yeah. All-purpose business application programming language yeah, or something. Okay. <laughs> because all good acronyms actually get new terms attached to the acronym. They're, right. they're so fungible. Yeah. It's, a, it's inevitable. So fungible. It's, you know, but it's the way our brains work. We manipulate symbols, and you know, acronyms yep. are as close as we can get to a small, dense symbol sure. that represents something more. Yep. Man, it's old school language world. Do you do the .NET thing? Like, do you, do you like a managed memory environment? Do you yeah, well, I mean, dot .NET used to be hot too sometime too, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And they can't kill that thing, right? Thanks <laughs> to rock stars like you guys. Well, yeah, <laughs> we, we, we take full credit for that. Yeah. Nice. Oh, yeah, so the resurrectors yes. of dot .NET. Right. Uh, yeah, we I mean, it's, it's really interesting. It's good to see, right? Yeah, so it's, it, and, because and there's nothing more valuable for an enterprise than working and running code. Mm -hmm. Don't yeah. touch it. Right. Right. You don't want to spend developer cycles of bringing that to the newest flashy platform. Platform right. until you really, really have to do it. Until it actually adds enough value to pay for the cost of that move. Well, like software development is painful. Yeah, it is. It's not just painful for the programmer, it's risky for the painful enterprise, for the right? Is this yeah. going to go? Is it going to work? How much is it going to cost me, right? Never touch Working running code, code right? Yeah. So, you know, it, it, it's not just that the platform is amazing and it's fast and it's portable and runs everywhere, but the main language, C Sharp, you know, the main language of .NET is so elegant and, and developers just love to use it. It's just a joy to use. And so I think that, you know, those things combined just just make yeah, it such yeah. a, a great idea. But I still love the inline fo functions and Fortran, you know? That was, that was really <laughs> elegant, you know? That's okay. kind of right. Dude. right here we when go. carriage returns were expensive, right? <laughs> that's, that's the real time, that's the real beauty, oh, right? I so. just spent a week building a white space remover. <laughs> I'm nice. going to run it on all our code. Yeah. Back when I was first writing for magazines, which is in the 90s, they had an April Fool's Day issue. Mm. <laughs> and so <laughs> the, the editor reaches out to me and he goes, hey, I got this April Fool's Day issue. Do you have any, like, gag code or something? Right, right, right. And this is in the VB era, so it's the early 90s, or yeah. 95. And I couldn't, I was racking my brain. What can I do in VB no. that would be funny? And right. so... I realized that Visual Basic, that old Visual Basic, still supported the colon separator for statements. Right. Mm -hmm. So I wrote a one-line game in VB. That's funny. And it was a maze game where you had to find your way out by moving north, south, east, west yeah. based on how much wind you could feel. So in this one line, it would randomly pick an XY coordinate and then it would keep track of your own XY coordinate. And as you moved, it would decrement, increment the different coordinates and then do a computation to give you an expression about, uh, you know, you, the wind is getting stronger, the wind is getting weaker to find your way out of it. All in one line of code. That's and I'm not sure right. what you call but it sounds complicated, right? It does sound complicated. <laughs> so, so I write this thing up, I got it working. I'm like, I'm sorry, I can't think of anything really clever, but I got this one line code thing. It's stuff we used to do years ago, and I, I did it in VB, and uh, I'm sorry if, 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 it, if it wastes your time. And I get a message back from the editor a couple hours later. He goes, your stupid idea just ate up an hour of my life. <laughs> 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 <That's great>. <laughs> <laughs> and he published it. <laughs> so the qu I, big question is, right, did you ported to .NET? I did not. You did uh, not. Slacker. <laughs> but it's only one line of code. Come on. One hard, line of code. Hard can I liked it be? In the, in the old <laughs> days, since we're all old and we're geeking out here about old stuff, the Quick Basic compiler had an option to turn off error messages from the compiler. Yeah. It was like slash D or something like that. And so we published a thing that said, you know, use this option to turn off all those pesky bugs. Yeah. Let's <laughs> get rid of all the bugs. Yep. Debug it. De yep. Just turn those things. That was option explicit, right? Yeah. No, no, no. This is a compiler command right. line switch. Yeah. It, it suppressed error messages. Just suppress all the error messages. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you get rid of all your typing problems. You just go option implicit. And then there was the other <laughs> April Fool's thing. I, I'm sorry. We, this is like a completely fluffy show today. But <laughs> the, the other April Fool's thing I saw was the thing that strips out all the comments to make a smaller, faster uh, <laughs> app. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. No, I did optimization. I really did. Yeah. <laughs> hey, so true story, right? I did some programming with UCSD Pascal, true Pascal story, right? Yeah. Uh, the, f the breakthrough in productivity was to have two floppy disk drives, right? Yes. You didn't have to change them in the meantime. 
and stripping out the error message and warning would save floppy disk space, which was, precious. as a high school student, precious and expensive, yeah, yeah, right? So, right. I mean, these error messages, yeah, you look at some of the code examples at Buildings here, I think, <laughs> like, I mean, these right. people are wasting. That's right. Wasting. Hey, characters. hang on right there for one minute, Holger, while we take a minute to pay the bills. This episode of .NET Rocks is made possible in part by Windows on the Google Cloud Platform. You may not know this, but the Google Cloud Platform supports Windows Server 2008, 2012, and 2016. It also supports SQL Server versions 2012, 2014, and 2016 standard web and enterprise editions with high availability. You can deploy your ASP.NET Windows apps to Compute Engine or your ASP.NET Core apps to App Engine or Container Engine. That's Google's hosted Kubernetes environment. .NET and .NET Core libraries are there for all 200 plus Google.com and cloud services in NuGet, led by John Skeet of Stack Overflow fame. But what about Visual Studio integration? Oh, it's there. You can use Visual Studio to manage your GCP resources and deploy your existing apps. You get stack driver logging, error reporting, and tracing support for .NET and .NET Core. PowerShell commandlets for GCP, which run on Windows and Linux. And a great set of partners to bring your Windows and .NET workloads to GCP, including Capgemini, Nudesic, and Magenic. So go to gcp.netrocks.com and get your free trial today. And you're listening to .NET Rocks. We're here in Build. It's Carl and Richard, and we're talking to Holger Mueller. Where do we go from here? So I want to know what you think, yeah. Holger, about what you've seen here at Build, the keynotes, the things that Microsoft is doing, maybe things you haven't seen yet, but are you seeing patterns of design and architecture repeating themselves? Yeah, it's a great, great question. I, th I think there's only so many ways to skin a cat, right? Yeah. So at the end of the day, software has to do what software is supposed to do. But the exciting time that we live in right now is that for the first time, technology can do more than what business best practice demands. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So in the past, your trusted technologist, programmer, developer was the person which would make your requirement run somehow, somewhat on the hardware capacity that was available. Right. And it was always a compromise. Yeah, right. Right. I mean, screens, UIs are compromised, right? We still, today we only suffer on network throughput and battery, right? The last yep. things which are not being affected by Moore's law. Right. So the really interesting thing is the cheap available compute by the cloud, which does right. of course what Microsoft's all over, powers AI, yep. powers neural networks. The no cost of storage, right? Us making fun about floppy disks, right? right I mean, right. I, I know complete, can't mention names, large enterprise software releases not making it with quarter end dis repercussions because you couldn't ship the software yeah. because you didn't have enough CDs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the same story repeated itself because you didn't have enough DVDs. So, yeah. mm -hmm. so these were the realities of DevOps back in the day. So <laughs> now we don't have these requirements anymore. Right? Storage yeah. is unlimited, it's cheap, computers are cheap, and that changes best practices. And that opens the whole world up for. I don't know anymore how to best run my business. Hey, I have to go back and experiment. Mm -hmm. right. Right, which gets you back into the 50s. In yeah. the 50s, people for the first time bought Compute, which was a mainframe. Right. And guess what? There was no software for it. It's a too old, so it's independent, must be a true story. <laughs> so yeah, old, it's independently verified, right? Yeah, so it. two CIOs tell me, you know, Holger, when you negotiate hard with IBM in the 50s, 60s for a mainframe, what the rebate would be that you would get? You guys have an idea? No, no idea. No rebate on the hardware, Zero. but you would get two developer years for free. Wow. Because you had no software for it, right? right so right. you wouldn't discount what was unique, but developers, even then the 50s, 60s on punch cards were expandable, right? Wow. So we're in a similar situation again, where the software for the 21st century, how do I run an enterprise, right? How, how do I go on the value chain side of things? How do I go on the supply chain of science? How do I run things internally in HR and finance? Has not been defined. Yeah. It's a time of experimentation, which makes developers yeah. very interesting. And we're engineers precious. again, aren't we? Yeah. I mean, we're seriously putting together inputs and outputs that we've got a, a palette that's huge, and a lot of these things haven't been done before. And effectively Correct. infinite compute to do it on. So Correct. you and can't afford to experiment. Yeah. And you see that in so many areas, like CFOs and quarterly end calls. If they would crack the whip on their staff, they would do three, four simulations for the financial analyst to ask me, hey, and what happens if the dollar loses value? Or right, if right. China has a flooding? Or whatever. Three, four scenarios. They would pick and they would be prepared for that if somebody asked it. Now you run a thousand. 
Yeah. Yeah. And all Why of not? a sudden, the CFO said, "Well, I don't need my financial data in the cloud." Whoops! There goes the <laughs> financial data into the cloud because <laughs> the CFO, my competitor, when listening on their earnings call, had all these scenarios. And these uh, badass financial analysts is asking me, "Well, if the dollar goes there and the euro goes there and the weather in Thailand is bad and the high HDDs are flooded, what do you do then?" And nice. I had an answer for that scenario. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I, you know, I'm, I'm one of the old school Ralph Kimball OLAP guys back when oh. the compute resources were expensive yeah. and like, you spent a long time crafting a data warehouse and it was all about trying to keep that, that yeah. speed of intuition running. What? And data mining, you know, you studied it for a long time before you picked an algorithm. Now the cloud comes along and says, how about we run all the algorithms yeah. <laughs> and then we'll apply the algorithms to the sets we ran to see which ones we like the yeah. most and, yeah, and yeah. it costs us nothing and it costs us, <laughs> it costs us almost nothing right? yeah. And, yeah and it's almost like you pick how long did you want to wait right that's all and it, but the trade of time over you know money there is very interesting it's right. like oh, I can run this in 15 minutes or I can run it in an hour yeah. it's just about a compute resources and it probably comes at the same dollar amount because they charge me by the minute anyway right, right. No, but it's fascinating what you can do with software these days, right? So sure. I would give an example for that price uh, change and the cost reduction, right? Uh, there's a startup in Silicon Valley which chases the whole internet mm -hmm. with spiders for sales lead information, to so capture leads, right? They look for new people appointed, new companies have funding, and then they sell it to CRM system vendors and to CRM users say, hey, I know who's new person there. So their cost of doing that for the whole internet on 500 CPUs, won't mention the public cloud, ingesting roughly one and a half terabytes of data wow. is less than our hotel room here in Seattle. Sure. And not, not a luxurious hotel room. <laughs> <So> <laughs> luckily, this doesn't happen to our hotel room, so it's happening to how much that costs as use case. And yeah. it's fascinating. No, and it's, it's just, just fascinating. You can brute force these solutions now. Just yeah. check everything. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. And if you mess up, you know, you just... Destroy it, start Do over it again. again. Yeah. Do it again. Not a fail big deal. fast, right? Fail yeah. fast, fail, fail fast. Often. Yeah, try, yep. and try some more things. The data analytics side is just interesting now because when you discover something meaningful, like right. when you find it, they, 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 they're really profound. Like you can act yep. on a huge amount of information now because you've got this a And you can have the view. software act on the software, right. Right? Mm -hmm. which is the interesting thing on the neural networks that software can learn by itself, yeah. right. which is a breakthrough by itself, right? Yeah. So it was always like, you needed to have a programmer, it needed to be a control environment, you would ship data around on tapes <laughs> yeah. to get that done as an example, and now you just take every 10 transaction out, doesn't cost you much, and the software can learn, right? So yeah. the whole profession of the data scientist, which was like a super safe job to go in, right, has been more or less gone because only the super, super smart data scientists who can do the models over the models right. have a future, right? The rest is cheap compute. And it's software is replacing the average professional on an average day. Although, you know, the conversations we've had with the data scientist types now, it's still yeah. trying to get the right question. Because you can uh, always get an answer, right. but figuring out good questions is hard. That's right. my, my view is like, when data scientists ask you, what is your question? He's already an old star data scientist. Oh yeah? No, because the data is there. You have to find the answers from the data which you didn't know. What is this data telling us? Exactly, the what's now? the data telling me? Because you're back like, you said OLAP, right? Data warehouse time. Right. Tell me your, what do you want to do when I'll build your, your dimensions and your fact table exactly. and you'll have something. And if you don't change it, it's going to be three months, but we'll change it for you. Yeah. That's not the solution. This no. can't be the solution right. in now the age the where, where it's about data as a service. Where somebody comes, hey Carl, do you want to know a little bit about these other podcast users? And I give you a couple of trial emails to prospect on, and you say, oh yeah, I'm going to try it for a month, right? It's going to cost you nothing, and if you like, it's going to be by shot. How do you model that in a classic yeah, sure. data warehouse? There's yeah. no way. Yeah, right. There's Very no way. Model. Yeah. So yeah. if anybody says, ask the questions and build you something, it's already the wrong path. Right. Yeah. Okay. Well, Richard, you know what time it is uh, now. It must be that happy time again. You got it. It's time to forge pod a new app pod up in the cloud pod to aggregate our pod podcast pod 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 <laughs> pod. All right, this pod crazy thing's really gotten to you, hasn't it? I can't it? help myself, pod. <laughs> One of the fascinating things of the English language is that normally has less vocabulary <laughs> than European, other European languages, right. is that when it comes to groups of animals, it has all these kind of different names, which I'm not on top of, but I know a pod is something like a group of fish, right? So we haven't heard uh, that before. A pod of orcas. Yeah, uh, right. exactly, right? So is, is that the original pod, maybe? Yeah. Uh, I don't know. 
You got me, but I know that your language in particular, German, is notorious for really long words. Yeah. Uh, it's a right? combination of words, Just right? It's concatenated things. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Can, they put they their, but, but I mean, developers do that all the time with oh, yeah. variables, right? Just put a dot into it. And right. Yeah. <laughs> a cut, bit of camel case and you keep going. Well, it's actually time to give away a D Experience subscription from Developer Express to one lucky member of the .NET Rocks fan club. Become a UI superhero with DevExpress UI controls and libraries and deliver elegant .NET solutions that address customer needs today and leverage your existing knowledge to build next generation touch-enabled solutions for tomorrow. Whether it's an Office-inspired application or a data-centric analytics dashboard, DevExpress Universal ships with everything you'll need to build your best without limits or compromise. Learn more and download your free 30-day trial at devexpress.com slash superhero. All right, buddy. Who's our winner? Today's winner is Timothy J. Cooper. Ah, Russia's Tim. Yes. I'll clap for you, sir. Absolutely. Maybe a little louder in a golf cup because it's noisy here. <laughs> yes. Golf clap for Tim. He just won the D Experience subscription. That's a big pile of awesome from our friends at Developer Express. Just for being a member of the .NET Rocks fan club. And hey, if you don't know what that is, go to .NET Rocks.com. Click on the big Get Free Stuff button. Answer a few questions and join the .NET Rocks fan club. We have thousands of members all over the world. And every show, we like to give away stuff from our sponsors. And every December, we give away a $5,000 technology shopping spree to one lucky member of said fan club. But you have to sign up to win. And we also like to ask our guests, Holger, if you had $5,000 you asked to spend on technology today? On technology today? What would you buy? Well, we had built, right? And uh, I just had another HoloLens demo, which is uh, really, really yeah. cool with the truck. If you guys have a chance, look at that thing. So For sure. Yeah. It really convinced you over. So, and, and the most thing which I like, I mean, we, the analysts, they gave us to us two years ago already. Yeah. And it was like kind of like a little more flimsy, I would say. And yeah. they swear to me they've not enlarged the viewing area because I mean, what's the most important thing if you see something, at That's least right. for the half population that we are part of or the world, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Size matters, right? Yeah. So, <laughs> so, so, so the viewing area, I can swear to you, is bigger than it used to be two years ago. And that makes a heck of a difference because oh, yeah. I, I mean, I we all move our heads all the time by looking at things, right? So it's natural. But if it's too tiny, you have to move it too much How to is see that things around though, that. that the viewing. I wonder if they've revved the hardware and just not told anybody. Um, you know? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. It's a good, it's a good uh, question. I think there's something going on with the hardware anyway. It's possible. Because I mean, it's it's been long enough. Moore's law applies. Yeah. So, but the, you know, the whole thing has been that the Hololens two they decided not to release it. They're going directly to Hololens three yep. for 2019. Yeah. Not that I have any facts. It's just why I'm you know able to talk about this. Because if I knew anything, they'd swear me to secrecy. I don't yeah. know anything. Yeah. So I would try to buy two Hololens because only fun if you have two things together and try true. to get a discount, right? So <laughs> That's true. Maybe on the old spec. Yeah, you go. But they haven't told us anything. It's no, they really haven't. I asked them if they've done a new spec. I challenged them on the Moore's Law question one of our q and A's. that, well, some stuff gets cheaper on the whole and some stuff not. Yeah. And then he was telling me the IP, then the property doesn't get cheaper. And I always have to laugh, right? Because yeah, yeah. I mean, that's the beauty of the software industry, which pays for nice conferences like this, right? Sure. Because yeah. you bill it once and you can run it so many times and have people pay for it, right? So that's the beauty of this. Yeah, no, I, I think it's pretty exciting. And I, I'm a big believer. I think that the visor is the thing that will displace this, the phone. Right. The phone has sort of gone as far as it's going to go. You know, more or less, we haven't changed since the iPhone I ship. I don't agree. I don't yeah. agree. I think I'm something sure that's that handheld is just too damn convenient. Yeah. The, yeah. Something that's just on your face is pretty convenient, too. Well, but yeah, but it has to be on your face. Yeah. And it does interfere with your... And I mean, the interesting thing more. is, right, we all wear glasses here, right? Yes. So we used to have something on our noses. I mean, 80% of the population is not used to do that yeah, all right. the time. And the, the, the HoloLens is quite heavy. It is now. And also, it is also now. You're right. But also the headsets are quite heavy. Even yeah. Google Glass, which was much lighter. I yes. mean, yeah. I would think like, man, I noticed wearing that thing after 20 minutes. And yeah. my neck muscles are steeled by... <laughs> by, by wearing frames like on every walk the neck well the, the first first thing I do is grab my glasses and the last thing is put them away right so <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. I mean, I'm a trained athlete and I'm noticing Google Glass which is like uh, lightweight compared to the HoloLens right? yeah. so yeah, yeah. so I'm not sure about this I, my my personal favorite is going to be personal viewable holographic images yeah. coming probably from your smart device your smartphone right. Right? Right. because you don't want to show it to everybody but no. if I can just look at my movie here or visualize my data in three dimensional things and it's codified so I can only see it to a certain point that yeah. now combination with lightweight glass normal glasses that's if, you're right. that's be if yep. there is something that you know 
uh, analogous to like 3D glasses, right? Right. Yep. So something that's just glasses. Yep. But there's something in them that allows you to see something holographic what? that exists from something else. Like right. it, it's not projected into your retinas like the HoloLens is now, but could come from a device or you know something what? simple that could project them. Yeah. That, that'd be pretty cool. And even if the first holographic things I think will be like our laptop displays, right. kind of like size and form, and today if I walk around I can look on your laptop display and see what you're looking at, what movie you're seeing on the plane or whatever. Yep. I mean, I think we'll start there and then we'll find a way to manipulate maybe the way how we see our that's codified to your personal probably social security number again, right? Because that's such a handy identifier, <laughs> yes, right? and so unique. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right, let's talk about barbecue now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, Holy spine hot. Real stuff, uh, yeah. man. I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm hungry, I guess. Yeah, I no. think, yeah, Carl and I really got to know each other way back in the beginning in a good German restaurant, actually. Yeah, so. that's right. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It was Where is a good German restaurant? Uh, it was this up was in, in Montreal. It was in Montreal, yeah. right. Montreal. Yeah. You can go and find all kinds of food Proper in Montreal. Proper Spätzle, yeah. that's what it was. Yeah. Spätzle. 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 It has Proper an umlaut. Spätzle. Like Müller. So, yes, yeah. like Müller. I know and it's I, hard. I, I believe we did <laughs> pick a part of Schweinhock. Yes. Yeah. 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 Uh, it's a good. It's all good yeah, stuff. Yeah, I was hoping the name Müller would get more popular by the baseball player and the FBI director, which <laughs> did not get fired with that last <laughs> name. But it's still Müller, and it's Müller. Uh, Come on, that's fine. We're we're a constant source of entertainment to you guys, aren't we, <laughs> Americans? <laughs> it's, no, it's <laughs> constantly. Well, I know I'm amused. It's, I'm living here since 18 years, and I'm still laughing. Let's yeah, put it like okay, this. Right? It's still good. amusing. That's great. Uh, yeah. The, they did some serious artificial intelligence demos this time around. Yeah. Although I'm getting to really hate the term. Yeah. Yeah. The line I've been using is artificial intelligence is the technology that doesn't currently work. Yes. <laughs> as soon as it does work, we give it a new name. We just call Fair it. Fair enough, yeah. 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 We call it AI Branding. when it didn't speak very well. Once it spoke perfectly, right. natural language user interface. But, but here's but. the things that they showed with both human recognition, you know, I can recognize a person in a, from a live stream of a video. Right. Yep. I can also recognize objects, and I can tell when those objects are placed in a wrong position. Right. I can tell when an unauthorized human picks up an object, right. and that can trigger logic that will immediately make things happen, like notify the authorities nearby, notify this kind of stuff. This is just, these are things that are unheard of, right. you know, yeah. today. And I found myself bouncing between, oh my God, that's cool, and, and holy, that's creepy. That's super what creepy. Yeah, happening super creepy. Yeah. There's a fine line between uh, super useful and super creepy, right? Here comes well, that eczema yeah. again. Well, and I, th and I think Microsoft picked a good topic on how to embrace that around stuff like safety at a construction yeah, site. That's right. Yeah. And in, in, a, in a hospital, like some of the most palatable environments. Right. right. But I mean, the reality is the cameras are already all around us. Right. Yeah. So the question is, can, can we use the data to, to do good with? Right. Uh, so, so there's always like every new technology. There's upside for good things and upside for not so sure. good things, yeah. right? So otherwise, it's not a viable we'll, technology, right? Really. And if the technology is successful, it will happen yeah. with all the good and bad things, as we know. Right. Right. The, the fascinating thing is that the legislative process, which regulates this, is so far behind. So right? and getting yeah. further behind. And, yeah. and it's, it's not reacting to it, right? Yeah. So um, take take yeah. the the San Bernardino iPhone. Right. problem, right? So if, if, if you have something traditional world, right, we have a set up legal system that the authorities can get a, a search warrant, right, and they find a safe in your house and you don't cooperate, you don't give them the key, they can force a locksmith to open it, he will right. compensate for it, right, you get compensated for the broken safe if nothing was in it, mm -hmm. but there's a way to get into it, right? Now the person has a smartphone which is on some cloud where the cloud provider is not cooperating, right. what do you do? Yeah. But we yeah, also have the, the, the problem of having states have their own rules about these things, yeah. which, which takes 50 times longer to make the laws work everywhere, of right? Course. Because typically you have laws that get passed in a state because something happened in yeah. that state. Right. Somebody died, right. somebody was killed, somebody had a problem, and that in, you know, state enacted a law that, that made things better there, but the other states aren't going to follow suit just because right. that one. But the territoriality of the U.S. system is one of the deepest fascinations of Europeans. You know? It is. Well, from and watching the rest, your and first the rest Western, of the world. where the gangster or the, the yeah, bad yeah. cowboy with the black hat was riding over the, the <laughs> sheriff's <laughs> the jurisdiction oh, yeah. over the river, and he couldn't do anything anymore. <laughs> it's went, unthinkable from a European perspective. That only happens right? today so in Wyoming. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
Okay, I mean, I'm sorry, I'm, I I'm holding Wyoming. my smartphone over the state border. <laughs> <laughs> I love Wyoming. But the upside yeah. of that system of also is, like you said, one state does it, yeah. then another state does it, and at a certain but threshold, suddenly it becomes it, be, it elevates itself to a federal mandate. Yeah, like yeah. In some ways, I feel, and I'm not normally saying this with things like it has a progressive element to it. Where yeah, right. I think in a, in a European model, and, and when we talk about Canada, it's really this British parliamentary model. It ends up being very all or nothing. Yeah, like the fact that we can have test beds. Yeah, of, of, yeah. Nevada is allowing so much automated driving right now. So yep. you know they're going to work out the bugs in a state where there's just not a lot of people to hit. But it does. But the make Texans up them, right? The Texans allowed the flying car. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So that. there's a competition. Well, right? If we could just get a flying car, yeah. we'd be okay. <laughs> but but you allowed it already. So <laughs> that's the. It does make for a weird experience for Americans that travel around. We used yeah. to have. One country where you could travel freely between, and you still can travel freely between all the states. There's, yeah. no, there's no big borders or anything like that. But this morning, I, I go outside the hotel. We're in Seattle. Yeah. I'm from Connecticut. And there's a guy smoking a joint. Right. <laughs> and, you know, smells pretty good. <laughs> but that's beside the point. I'm sure it was I'm medical. Like, and yeah, <laughs> but, but it's legal here to do yeah. that. Yeah. And I'm just like, oh, oh, geez, does that guy know? Oh, wait a minute. I'm in Seattle. <laughs> You're in Seattle. I'm in Washington State. This is yeah. one of those laws that's in transition right, right now. Right, right. I mean, we didn't pass those laws in the provinces of Canada, but now the feds are talking about it right. countrywide. Yeah, yeah. So, right. you know, you're seeing these... Well, I definitely believe we're, we're way behind, especially on some of these higher tech elements yeah, yeah. Right. from a legal perspective. And it's hard to get a politician to understand a lot of this stuff. Yes, it is. It's hard to get a politician to understand how to log in. <laughs> Or even what that means. Yeah, or, or why they why their password shouldn't be password. <laughs> <That's right>. <laughs> but <laughs> oh, this is awesome. But it is it is. I'm glad we're still pressing against the edge of these things because it forces that conversation to happen. Exactly. Right. And, and it, yeah. you know, I think Microsoft did a good job today of presenting potentially threatening technology with very useful outcomes. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. Yes. No, definitely, it's, definitely it, good job on. The, and they do a good job on the security side too. Yeah. Right? I mean, we talk about the three hyper clouds. Everybody knows who they are. Sure. And, uh, well, they're not the retailer, right? They're not the search advertising giant, right? right. Yeah. So they're the one who has to play well with the enterprise and understand mm -hmm. security and privacy and understand that you might need a hybrid cloud option with Azure Stack as right. an example. So right. Uh, that's they, they, their customers will laugh at them if they don't open that, right? And they yeah. don't talk to the other guys for some reasons, right? So What about IoT obvious. Edge? Wasn't that amazing? It was really... Interesting. The, the whole idea is now that you can, now you can develop your logic for your IoT devices in the cloud, and then push it out to all the devices that are yeah. at the edge of the cloud. Yeah. So the, yeah, I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah, in a container. Come on. <laughs> well, okay. So, What's so, wrong with so the container? It's, 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 it's it was a, it was a rename. We learned that, and so it wasn't called Edge. It was the. IoT connector device, yeah, something which connector. was last year, right. which was actually great last year at Build. We were allowed to code on some Raspberry Pis and hook them up to the IoT cloud. This last time I coded, three lines copy and paste, but nice. still in proud remembrance. And yeah. thanks to Microsoft for doing this and allowing to do us. But I think it's interesting that you have to move things more to the edge. Yeah. I think it's going to be much more lightweight things than going to be pushed by a, You're probably by, right. by a container to it. I, right? I still so think a container is pretty lightweight. Even on a Raspberry Pi. Well, and Pi. the yeah. amount of compute we have in a smartphone these days, I mean, they're crazy yeah. powerful. What? I haven't seen a container host for a phone yet, but I don't doubt that oh, you no, could do it. Oh, no, they're totally one of them. No, yeah, no, without no. a doubt. Yeah. And that, yeah. that to me is really interesting. If you do it carefully, you know, well, it's it, a way to push software around. The, the, the container seems to me the solution of the distribution of code problem. Right, yeah. right, but, right. But it's not enough, as we all know, to have your code there. Right. It also has to run. Yeah, it has to yeah, have so a my, my that question makes sense. Was, what are your minimum definitions for an edge device? And the answer was, well, it can be a Windows, Windows or a Linux machine. We're looking at Macs. So that's, that's playing with fire to a certain point yeah, because yeah, you know okay. when you don't get, at least get minimum specs, people will try all kinds of things to, to run something on top of. So mm -hmm. okay. we, we'll, we'll see enough. where that goes. But, but I mean, the interesting thing is the, 
the offline scenario on the cruise ship, which is the whole Azure stack, right? Mm, so, yeah. and then sending the data back and forward, different solutions out there from different cloud providers. So, yeah. uh, that, that of course happens, right? You're, you're not always connected. Uh, no. We had this problem here trying to figure out when Christopher Columbus was born, right? right. <laughs> it, took, right. it took me my, my third lifeline, meaning my third <laughs> smartphone here to, to get a network. We won't say who the provider was, but. Because everybody's uh, got three. Obviously. <laughs> yeah. hey, hey. What? There's a reason why they have to be three, right? Yeah. So, yeah. That's I, right. I don't know why people can only have one smartphone. I mean, seriously. Well, like, yeah. yeah. So, so battery I, I, life, right? I mean, ABC always be charging, but I mean, how <laughs> do you walk on a phone without on a plane without holding up the line while you're on a phone call? Well, I only have right? two front so pockets, right? And my keys have got to go in one of them. And I never put my keys and my phone in the same pocket right. or the keys are scratched. This is why you have jacket pockets. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What's so a jacket, jacket pocket? The answer is more pockets. Yeah, yeah so. more po The answer is always more pockets. More pockets, pockets. more battery. <laughs> <laughs> you know, always I be gotta, charging. I got to have a coat just for my battery. <laughs> my charger. Coverage issues. There's so many reasons. Yeah. Like the true professional has... Two better three smartphones. That's what we learned the hard way, right? Right. I mean, how many data centers in one location, right? People prided themselves that you always open a location with two. Yeah. And then we learned, well, you actually need to have three to be high availability for the enterprise, right? Because if you're patching one and one goes down, yeah. The reality is you actually need four, right? <laughs> because <laughs> four is better than three, right? But you need four because if you lift one to the newest code of a database, well, what happens if you have your code still on the other one while you get redundancy for the other one? So four so wait is a the no, new you minimum. Need five, actually, five. <laughs> five, yeah, okay. You know, this this <laughs> math this works with guitars, too, by the way. <laughs> Tales of skis, too. Oh, pretty, oh, okay. pretty, right. pretty sure I did that with computers. Hey, are you hearing it? Are you, are you, did you hear that one, honey? Okay. <laughs> yeah. It's official now. She's it like, wasn't you have dot too nut. many guitars. <laughs> no, no, can't I have too many exactly guitars. Exactly the right guitars, amount of guitars. Guitars, surfboard, skis, right? So <laughs> <laughs> can't have too many. <laughs> I, mean, I do feel like we're moving in, like this whole idea of like you're going to do everything on your phone, like this cen central computing point, as opposed to there's just compute everywhere. Right. Yeah. Like, it's just going to be more compute. And the trick is, how do I move my identity? How do I move my intent? to whatever device is in front of me. Like, I right. don't like that I need to carry more than one phone that I'm bound yeah. to that. I want to be able to just drop my identity onto a device completely temporarily, right. spend time with that device to do the thing I need to do, and then gone. Exactly. And it all comes with me, it's over. Yeah. What did you think about Cosmos DB? Well, interesting to see Finally, DB innovations is a long time from yeah, Microsoft's side, right? Time. So right. I think it's great for solving NoSQL yeah. issues, right? I mean, amazing, in a nutshell, amazing what SLAs, is. what you can do, right? Distribute your data all over the world. Right. I would have wished that Azure DB slash SQL Server would be part of it. I'd call them out of saying, like, how can this thing be multimodal? Because if you hear, like, 30,000 foot multimodal DB, is always transactional and NoSQL, right? right? But there's nothing transactional in it yet, but right? It might be coming. They have document it's database. Document DB, yeah. it's MongoDB. And, and, and document DB, yeah. Exactly, yeah. And so uh, it's, it's actually, what I learned is a new version of document DB. So, yeah. I mean, it's always great to start a new thing like Cosmos DB with lots of users because, hey, this is just document DB 2.0. But some really whatever, interesting yeah. things that you pointed out here, uh, they have an SLA that gives you one millisecond latency. Un amazing, right? That's amazing. Amazing. So is the internet fast? Fast enough for that? I, yeah, it's crazy. I'm not, I'm not sure actually where they measure that. Yeah. If it's at the endpoint, or uh, probably it must be in their data center, yeah, right? Because then be there's the latency center. to get it out. Right. right. They haven't clarified that yet. Yeah, but, yeah. But, but for no SQL data, right? Right. We're talking and about files and pictures. We're not talking about. <laughs> so and you amazing. only pay for the compute and the storage that you use. Yeah. yeah. Which is, you know, you pay for for SQL Azure. You pay so much for the server, and then on top of that, right. you your usage. So. Yeah, so it's it's an economically viable and extremely fast promises to be an extremely fast uh, yep. solution. I wonder if some people are pumping their transactional database into Cosmos DB now because it's cheaper yeah. to run. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I'm going to try it. And, I, and definitely, it's like you know, build is always a shopping list of shows we're going to need to Absolutely. make. Absolutely. Like, yeah. Expect some Cosmos DB shows. Like yep. All these things are necessary as we learn more, too. Right. I mean, it was really only announced today. I, I, I hope some people are moving over to it because I want to know try what it. their experiences are. I'm Absolutely. definitely going to try we it need with, one. with our database. Sure. We'll the flip side, of course, is when cloud providers make such interesting offerings is to enterprises that you tie yourself into them, right? Yes. Well, you yeah. can't go taking your NoSQL code no matter what the container does somewhere else. Right. You don't right. get the same latency product API, right? So yeah. that's what you have to be aware of. And Speaking of NoSQL, NoSQL 
for uh, Azure and Postgres SQL for Azure were announced today yep. as well. Interesting. Yep. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm, uh, I like that Microsoft's trying to innovate on the platform level rather than just racing to the bottom of the right. cheapest VM. Right. Oh, yeah. Right. Bring, bring me services that will make a difference in, in my ability to deliver solutions. Right. Right. But, but that, that in the industry in general, that discussion is over pretty right. much, yeah. right? So yeah. the other company out of Seattle was doing this all the time. Now they do price reductions and don't even talk about them anymore. Yeah. Right. right. And then the, the other competitor in search was saying, hey, we do pay less, compute more. Mm -hmm. uh, we take the average reduction in cost <laughs> and give the advantage now, which was a strong point of showing that the other company in Seattle wasn't actually so cheap as they were saying they were. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so it so always takes someone to call out your bluff, which they basically did. Right. But it's all about functionality right now because the cost compared to your infrastructure on site is so high, right? This well, and, yeah. and even then, it's like, look, our software is so valuable. Like, mm. I've never been particularly concerned about development costs and, and hardware because the return on good software is 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 orders of magnitude what you spent and what it cost to operate. Right, yeah, As yeah. the bigger concern was failing the project entirely. Like the, or not finding the developer. Not yeah, having yeah, right. the developer. Not being able right? to get so it built. Like yeah. Missing that, that opportunity cost at the time of actually delivering on it. Exactly. Yeah. Those are the bigger issues. Yep. So what's next for you? Are you gonna take all the things that you see here at Build and you know write a blog post or do something uh, so write something or white papers or what do you generally do when you Yeah, so we, we do a lot of work around disruption mm -hmm. and we try to give a showcase of disruption for our industry, the industry, the industry analyst industry and yeah. uh, doing things much faster, right? Because people don't want to have a report or blog in five, six weeks, right? So yeah. first the first step for me is that I my notes are on Twitter. Okay. So it's a lot right. of tweets, but if you see I'm going to any show uh, you see everything real time if you're not there. Great. Or you can read it up from that perspective. The next thing what I do is I collect those in a tool called Storyfy, no endorsement. It works great to get them together. Awesome. So that is nice. out already. And then, I mean, video killed the radio, not the podcast, right? <laughs> <laughs> so I've done the video of, uh, on Google Hangouts with my colleague, Alan Lepofsky, who was here too, on our takeaways of day one. Great. And tonight, if uh, I have enough caffeine in me, there's going to be a blog post about day one happening. So That's awesome. awesome. Yeah. So it's all about acceleration, doing for things sure. faster, right? So Fantastic. Holger, super fun to meet you, man. Great. Thanks for so much for coming out. It's an honor to be here. I mean, yeah. this, was, this was too much fun. It was yeah. <laughs> definitely a lot of fun. A great way to end the day, the first day at, at Azure. And th that's the reason why we didn't talk about other things, because we don't know about them yet. So yeah. you'll have to tune in Time again. Time shifting is hard. 1451. Right. There you go. 1451. Thanks, Holger. Thanks for having me. All right. We'll see you next time on .NET Rocks. .NET Rocks is brought to you by Franklin's Net and produced by Pwop Studios, a full-service audio, video, and post-production facility located physically in New London, Connecticut, and, of course, in the cloud. Online at pwop.com. Visit our website at dotnetrocks.com for RSS feeds, downloads, mobile apps, comments, and access to the full archives going back to show number one, recorded in September 2002. And make sure you check out our sponsors. They keep us in business. Now go write some code. See you next time. Got a